Those who make things happen, they all share this quality. No matter how intelligent or able-bodied you may be, if you don't have a sense of urgency and the need to exploit your potential, you, Chevy dealers, will fall short of the mark. But what is hustle? Hustle is doing something everyone else is certain cannot be done. Hustle is getting the sale because you got there first or hung on after others gave up. Hustle is burning the midnight oil. It's blood, sweat, and tears. Hustle, Chevy dealers, is missing lunch. Hustle is getting the customer to say yes after he or she said no. Hustle is believing in yourself when no one else will. Hustle is heaven if you're a hustler and hell if you're not. Hustle is the only way in which you will reach your goals and objectives. Come to the edge, he said. They said, we are afraid. Come to the edge, he said. He came, he pushed them, and they flew. Let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others leave their future in someone else's hands, but not you. Thank you very much for bringing me to this very prestigious occasion. Kurt, you make me feel important. You know, there's only two times in life that you ever feel more alone. Right before you're about to die, and five seconds before you're about to give a speech. <laughs> My favorite public speaking story is a guy who joins Toastmasters. We know what Toastmasters is. Toastmasters is a self-help organization that helps individuals communicate effectively on their feet. Well, this young man goes to his Toastmasters meeting one Tuesday night, and they're using a process called table topics. Now, table topics is a process where everybody's dealt a card. On one side of the card, it's blank. On the other side, it's a subject. And when it's your turn to speak, you flip over the card, look at the subject, and give a one-minute talk off the top of your head. Well, everybody at the table had an opportunity to address the crowd. Now it's his turn. So he flips over the card, and the subject is sex. Okay? He comes up with three points. He comes up with an opening point, a concluding point, and he really brings it to a close. And don't you know he got a standing ovation? It was the best talk of his life, Chevy dealers. The place goes berserk. He got some suggestive criticism. He got some feedback. And on par, he felt great about himself. Till he went home that night. And his lovely wife says, well, John, what'd you speak on Toastmasters tonight? He said, don't you know it was the best talk I ever gave of my life? They gave me a standing ovation. She says again, well, what did you speak on? Man, the place went berserk. I love to She said, what did you speak on? And almost embarrassingly, he says, sailing. She says, sailing? You don't know anything about sailing. How in the world could you get a standing ovation to speak on something you know absolutely nothing about? And he really didn't want to get in the subject for one reason or another, and it was finally dropped. Until two days later, when his lovely wife is out shopping, and guess who she bumps into? Her husband's best friend who belongs to Toastmasters. He says, hi, Mary, how you doing? She says, fine. He says, boy, John sure gave a great talk at Toastmasters the other night. And she says, well, he looks forward to those meetings. They built his self-esteem. And then he said, boy, he sure seems to know a lot about what he's talking about. And her eyebrows shot up, and she says, well, that amazes me. <laughs> because he's only done it twice in his life. <laughs> the first time he got sick, and the second time he lost his hat. <laughs> Hopefully, my little 30-minute uh, talk, we won't do either of those. So, who is this man that stands before you, just like Kirk said? When I got my fancy PhD degree from Northwestern University, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I certainly knew what I didn't want to do. I don't want to be like many of my colleagues who went across the country. They wanted to go to Washington, D.C. and work in one of the various presidential administrations. I didn't want to do that. Some of my friends, some of my colleagues from Northwestern went the corporate route. I didn't want to go the corporate route, though I did do that for 10 years until I finished Napoleon Hill's book. Ironically, I didn't even want to teach. And here I was being trained to be a college professor, and that's what I am now. I'm just a B-school professor. I wanted to find the answers to two questions. Question number one, why does one person succeed while another fails? And question number two, why is one individual rich and wealthy while another is impoverished? 
So I carved out a list initially of about 50 African Americans. You name them, I probably interviewed them. They didn't know me. That list grew from 50 to 100. From 100 to 150. You name them, I probably interviewed them. I don't care from Ron Brown, Secretary of Commerce, all the way to Cynthia Cooper, WNBA MVP superstar. No matter who I interviewed, I was armed with my same three-page questionnaire, and I asked the same questions over and over again. Chevy dealers, I found four common chords in all these men and women. Number one, they dreamed big dreams. They had a dream, a passion, something they desperately wanted to accomplish in life. Point number two, they were inner directed versus outer directed. In other words, they weren't so quick to believe well-meaning friends and family members who said, you can't do this, you can't do that. They walked to a beat of a different drummer. And that's why the old poet Robert Frost was so apropos when he wrote years ago, two roads diverged in the wood and I, I took the one less traveled by. And you know that better than anybody else. You are unique. You cannot succeed being like everybody else. You must take that lonely road. As leaders of distinction, as, as mark of excellence Chevy dealers, you know that you know, the number one reason why anybody buys or uses any product or service is differentiation. So what's so different and unique about you? Point number three, they dedicated themselves to lifelong learning. Readers are leaders. You must take in the information. If you walked out these doors right now, 70% of all jobs out there in the workaday world are information jobs. Taking information from one source, delivering it to another. You live and have your being in a free and open capitalistic economy. Capitalism is not a dirty word. Only thing capitalism means is that everything is for sale. You take the word capitalism, write it on a piece of paper. C-A-P-I-T-A-L-I-S-M. Take the Latin derivative of the word capitalism. C-A-P-U-T, caput. <laughs> well, what does it mean in Latin? It means head. What's the one thing you must use in order to survive in this free and open society? You must use your head. And it doesn't take much to succeed because the competition won't take the time to read, if you will. If you read one book, listen, if you read a book a week and you do that for three years, you'll be known throughout your community. If you read a book a week and you do that for five years, you'll be known throughout the nation. And Lord have mercy, if you read a book a week, you do that for seven years, you will draw world recognition. Why? Because the average individual won't read. 58% of adults never read a book after high school. Only 3% of Americans have a library card. 600,000 words in the English language, the average adult in our society uses the same 1,200 over and over again. The bigger the house, the more personal volumes they have in the library. The smaller the house, the bigger the television set. So what's the bottom line? Either read or learn to fail gracefully. And speaking of failure, these men and women flat out refused to fail. I'm not saying they didn't fail. Many of them actually failed their way to success. But failure was never a viable option for them. There's a quote in my first book from Confucius that says, a man and woman is great not because they haven't failed. A man and woman is great because failure has not stopped them.